and television tonight. It's 8.30. Do you know where your brain is? By reading television tonight, I mean not to talk about television programming, and not even particularly to talk about television advertisements as such, but rather to put television in two contexts. One is a political context. To talk now politically is to talk about Ronald Reagan. So I'm going to be talking about television in the context of Ronald Reagan and his presidency. And I'm going to be talking about television in another context, and that's an historical context. The politics and the history of television. That context, the historical context, is one that goes back to the 1920s, back to the invention not of television, but of radio broadcasting in the early 20s. I'm going to talk now about the <coughs> introduction of radio broadcasting and what it meant to Americans thinking about radio in the 1920s. This was before there were networks, and in fact before there were radio advertisements. In the early 1920s, it was relatively easy to run and operate and to support radio broadcasting. Most radio broadcasters didn't spend much for equipment and didn't spend much to maintain the equipment. And the radio broadcasters of the early 1920s included lots of church groups, labor unions, private philanthropists, department stores, and radio manufacturers. The radio manufacturers figured that if they were going to sell radio sets, they would have to put something on the air in order for people to have some incentive to buy them. So they figured they would write off the cost of broadcasting in uh, against a lot of political objections. Let's look at a tape. The idea of broadcasting advertisements into the home to radio listeners was extremely controversial. In the 1920s, the regulation of radio didn't say anything about advertisement. Nevertheless, there was a lot of opposition to the idea of radio and advertisement. That is, from opposition not only from interest groups like listeners, like non-public or non-private broadcasters, but also from people like Herbert Hoover, who regulated radio before 1927, and from the first legal authority, the Federal Radio Commission, that regulated radio after 1927. The move to radio advertising as a form, as the only means of supporting broadcasting, was something that happened in the late 1920s, and it's something that came against a lot of popular resistance and uh, against a lot of political objections. Let's look at a tape. Not the least remarkable feature of this new invention is its accessibility. Far from being simply one more means of passive enjoyment, the radio has given rise to much ingenious manipulative activity.
is inconceivable that we should allow so great a possibility for service to be drowned in advertising chatter. Broadcasting stations are not given these great privileges by the United States government for the primary benefit of advertisers. Such benefit, as is derived by advertisers, must be incidental and entirely secondary to the interests of the public. I have always maintained that, like the telephone and the telegraph, radio is inherently monopolistic in character. The activity should be confined to two or three companies of established reputations, having the necessary facilities and incentives to develop it. Companies like Westinghouse, General Electric, United Fruit, AT&T, formed together RCA, which in turn in 1926 formed NBC, the first radio network. Those people had something very different in mind for radio than did the amateur broadcasters and the, the non-private broadcasters, that is, the broadcasters who were not using radio to make money, but rather to support civic education, uh, uh, public information, and private philanthropy. The idea of the private firms, these large uh, industrial corporations that dominated electrical manufacturing by the 1920s, was to use radio to support private advertising. Their <coughs> model was the private, uh, like a magazine or a newspaper, that is, time would be sold, in this case airtime, to a private advertiser to sell something. Even though, by the late 20s, this was in fact the way that almost all broadcasting was supported in America. That is, the non-private broadcasters were more or less driven out of business, in part through the actions of the federal government. But even so, in the 1934 Act, which rewrote the original 20s legislation on, tele on radio, in the language of the Act itself was the requirement that every broadcasting station, every licensee, had to serve, quote, the public interest. And that was taken very seriously in the 1930s. There was a lot of uh, public sentiment and congressional sentiment against advertising as late as the mid-30s in favor of outright banning of advertising. And in the 1930s, in the very profitable period for radio networks like NBC and then CBS, they still uh, offered a lot of what they call sustaining programming. That is programming that was sent to their affiliates sometimes a third to a half of their airtime, their scheduled time, that was without sponsorship. The idea of sustaining programming then was to support programming that what didn't, for one reason or another, appeal to private broadcasters, that is, to advertisers, to sponsors. Those reasons might be that it was of controversial nature, public affairs. It might be that the ratings were expected to be lower than maximum, that, are, that it might be high culture, programming, that it might be uh, experimental, artistically uh, or aesthetically. One reason or another, a lot of the programming sent out by these very profitable networks in the 1930s was sent out, in effect, at a loss, that is, unsponsored. And in part, this was due to the, the sway of the idea and the political weight behind the idea, the insistence on public interest in broadcasting. Television presented a very different situation. The same firms, particularly RCA, headed by David Sarnoff, the interests of those firms involved in developing television were very different. They did not want to repeat what they called the mistakes of radio. The chief mistake was the idea of non-commercial radio. They didn't want to see that political situation rehearsed again. So that from the very beginnings, the introduction of radio in the early 1940s was built around the idea of commercial sponsorship. There was going to be no sustaining programming on television. Every program would be designed and suited for a commercial sponsor. The idea of commercial television exclusively 
had a lot of force behind it because uh, there were widespread fears right during the war that after World War II there would be a shortage or uh, an incredible kind of economic crunch when in fact we might enter a period of recession or in fact de uh, economic depression. Television was going to be the tool to inspire consumer demand to sell products in that post-war period. Let's look at another tape. Obviously, the post-war problem is not one of production, either farm production or industrial production. It is one of demand and distribution. Television has the power to create consumer demand and buying of goods and services beyond anything we have heretofore known. The medium is extremely well suited to low interest products because it is an intrusive medium. Products can be injected where they are not wanted, which doesn't sound very moral, but is a fact of life with television. New Ice Blue Secret Spray Deodorant to help stop perspiration odor for your whole family so you feel cool, calm, protected. Terrific. Our first party. Yeah, and I hope it's the last. What's wrong? He gets so nervous meeting people. Worries about perspiration odor. Tried this? Well, she gets that wicked tan with the sea and ski. Fast work and burn, stop and dog, tan and sea and ski. You don't know what a real tan is until you get a sea and ski tan. Sea and Ski's unique sun filter lets in way more dark tanning rays than the nearest competitor. Stops most of the burning rays. Stops them cold. Sea and Ski suntan lotion or new fast tanning foam. Fast working burn, stopping dark tanning Sea and Ski. Chevrolet presents. the number one way in a Chevrolet. The viewer watches commercials in the same way that he watches programs. He does not think of commercials as something different and apart from programs. The viewer not only watches commercials and is influenced by them, but he feels obligated to watch and be influenced. <laughs> Chevy Tune Nova. No tricks, just reliability and a handy size. Take this four-door sedan. So trim and practical. Nova is a real no-nonsense car. The air lanes belong to the people of the U.S. The people have decided to sell those air lanes to advertisers for commercial purposes. Don't blame the advertisers if this produces dull, sterile, imitative programming. Blame the system. We are in the same position of a plumber laying a pipe. We are not responsible for what goes through the pipe. People like what we're giving them. First we build a habit factor, get them used to watching us. Then we can do something about upgrading programming. We're not interested in the critics. If we listened to the eggheads, we'd be out of business in six months. I'm not sure I know what it is that has to be reformed. I don't think anyone has proven that bad television is harmful.
A program in which a large part of the audience is interested is by that very fact a program in the public interest. By the end of the 1950s then, around the time that you heard and saw those quotes from the three network leaders, the television industry had found a home in pretty much its present day form. That is, it was an industry dominated by three networks who made most of the programming decisions, who dominated at least in the large markets about 90 or 95% uh, of the airtime of affiliate stations. And it was a fairly tight world involving sponsors, program producers, Hollywood studios and independent companies, and the three networks. All of them, all of those uh, relationships defined around the central commercial relationship, which was a sponsor buying time to sell a product. The idea of marketplace television, the public interest is what the public is interested in, that was coined by the CBS president in 1960, is uh, misleading in a couple ways. First of all, the public, the viewers, we, are not the consumers of television in the sense that we're not the market. We are not what, uh, we don't buy television. We are, in fact, what is sold to sponsors of television. So pleasing the market is not pleasing the audience necessarily so much as pleasing the mass advertisers. That has a couple implications. It, first of all, means that we're not all equal in the eyes of advertisers. If you want to sell certain products, old people, poor people, minorities, young people, children, are not of interest. So that the collapse of uh, an audience into consumers is not one, one of total identification. The other reason why there is no television marketplace, in the terms defined by the public interest is what the public is interested in, is that all the legislation going back to the 20s and 30s is built around the notion of scarcity. Scarcity simply means that not all of us, or in fact any of us, who decide we want to start a television or radio station can go out and start one. The fact, if we wanted to start a newspaper and we had some money, we could buy a press. It's free to those who own them. In television and radio, however, if you and I decided to buy and start a television station, we'd be in jail tomorrow. In other words, it's not a free market because literally there is no free entry. It's a very small market, and those stations up for sale are worth uh, several uh, scores of millions of dollars. And it's not because they own a lot of television equipment. It's not because they have uh, expensive antennas. Uh, television stations still only cost half a million or a million dollars in terms of equipment. They cost so much more than that because you're guaranteed a share monopoly. In other words, there are only seven stations in New York. There are only four or three in most other markets in America. So to talk about market and a free market in television is to mislead the viewer in a couple ways. The idea that the consumer, the customer, is not the audience, but in fact the advertiser, and that in fact there isn't a free market because there isn't free entry. There is very limited or almost no competition. So some things changed since 1960. First of all, American television, the programming, and the hardware companies like RCA moved internationally. They went along with the multinational ad agencies who in turn followed multinational corporations who were finding new markets as the American demographics, as the baby boom began to dwindle. There, were more, there was more money to be made out there in Europe and in, in part in the third world. In the 1960s then, television becomes internationally a commercial medium. That is, country after country began to introduce commercial systems of broadcasting, often displacing uh, public broadcasting 
state-supported broadcasting, license fee-supported broadcasting, non-market broadcasting. So what you see in the 1960s, continuing through the 70s, is a kind of worldwide or internationalization of commercial television. The second thing, and this is more recent, is that since the 1970s, the network's hold on us, on the primetime audience, on people, the television sets across America, has begun to weaken. It's still very strong. They still get more than two-thirds of the normal audience, day and night, no matter what they program. But nevertheless, it's not the 95% that they're used to, and they're very much afraid that it may become even less. The reason for that shrinking of share is simply, there are many things. One is cable. One is cable systems like HBO, which distribute programming by satellite. And also, a, uh, increasing viability of other non network stations, that is, unaffiliated stations. What you have then in the 1970s going through the 80s is a rhetoric built around these technological changes, built around satellites, built around cable, built around interactive cable, designed to prove to us, to convince us, that in fact we face a new competitive environment, that we face a new environment of abundance, of diversity. Let's take a look. Television has a great future. Half the people in the world are illiterate. You have to think globally. If you own a show, you own it worldwide. there will be a new star in the sky soon. TV viewers would have another source of programming, this time from a satellite sending programs direct to the home. New high-power satellites would beam programs directly to subscribers with small rooftop antennas. Each of the four satellites would cover a distinct area of the United States. is going to get bigger, it's going to get richer, and that healthy profits are in the public interest. Mark Fowler is not the captive of any industry or of industry in general. I am a captive of a philosophy of government we call Reaganism. I call service to the people, all the people. What I'm saying is that the better business does, the better people do. of interactive television, the tremendous range of TV viewers' options will contrast ironically to their shrinking options outside the home. Unlike the expanded range of video services, the scope of our lives will narrow. There are, uh, this is a particularly important time for television and for uh, broadcasters and for the audience, not merely because of the uh, situation in Washington. That man, Mark Fowler, who's the present FCC commissioner, the man who rules the airwaves, worked as a broadcast lawyer. That is, he represented private broadcasters before he came to the commission. And he also was an advisor to Ronald Reagan's two political campaigns in 1976 and 1980. More, I think, than any other cabinet member, more than James Watt, for example, Ronald, uh, Mark Fowler at the FCC has incarnated Reagan's philosophy. More than simply rhetorically, he's put it in effect. For example, they have deregulated radio, which means that radio stations are no longer required to what is called ascertain public needs. They're no longer required to fit their plans with local needs. Uh, they're no longer required to run any minimum length of public affairs or news broadcasts. 
and they're no longer constrained to running any length of commercial. There could be a 24-hour commercial radio station. Fowler would like to do the same to television. He would like to deregulate, or in what in fact he calls unregulate television. That is, no regulations whatsoever. The other things he'd like to do is move against the spirit of reform and some real progress that was made in the 1970s through public interest in broadcasting. Litigation and representations in front of the FCC succeeded in revoking some stations' licenses. Very few, but it scared a lot of broadcasters. Fowler wants to reassure those broadcasters. He wants to let them know that whatever they decide the marketplace, they will serve it and he will be satisfied. Basically, what Fowler is saying is the marketplace can't lose. That is, the only way a broadcaster could lose his license is by, in fact, going out of business, by, in fact, not serving, uh, not finding listeners or viewers, which is, in fact, impossible. Um, what is going on, I think, uh, more importantly in terms of the rearrangement of American industry is that we've seen a convergence between broadcasting, the motion picture industry, telecommunications, meaning our friends the phone company, and uh, data transmission and storage, meaning IBM. All of these things are joining together at a large level, and what they're looking at is the possibilities for extreme profitabilities and no regulation. So there's an attack on the entire idea of the public interest. What I think is up to the public now is to fight at every level, the city level for cable franchises and for the enforcement of cable franchises, and at the federal level to insist that the large corporations moving into these fields and staying in broadcasting not succeed in rewriting the rules of the game to suit their private advantage. 